Thank you so much. A fifty plus five twenty. Thank you very much. Uh, you have to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vadaj and the organizers for inviting me here. And in the last six years, I have been given this honor of coming here and interacting with the students and scholars in this department. Before I start my submissions, I want to, uh, in fact, my, the topic on which I will speak is Establishment Rules Pakistan. Before I open up on this topic, I want to define two characters who are going to play an important role in the next few weeks and next few months. One of them is the Army Chief of Pakistan who heads the establishment at present. He is General Asim Munir. And second one is a three times former Prime Minister, Mr. Nawaz Sharif. First, we'll brief introduction about these two and then we'll discuss establishment and the role it is playing in Pakistan. Asim Munir, and you will not find it in Google or anywhere else, was born on 14th March 1964 in a school teacher's house. He has two brothers and a sister and the family was lower middle class. He got his education in Rawalpindi and in sociology they say social mobility that is the term which is used in sociology. This man did his matric in 1979, his father was a school teacher and in 1982, in August, he joined as a Sipahi, as an airman in Pakistan Air Force. Now see the long jump he has made from a Jawan, as a, in, he was not in the army, he was in the Air Force. As an airman, he joined in 82. And now he is the head of the establishment and in a way he rules Pakistan and takes most important decisions. He tried twice while serving as an airman to go into Pakistan Military Academy at Kakul. But it is Kakul is a small place and it is in the district of Abbottabad in Northwest Frontier Province which is now called Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. He failed, but I would pay tribute to him that he had that diligence and perseverance. Instead of trying for the third time in the Pakistan military academy exam, Asim Munir chose another path. That path he chose was, he tried for officers training academy, which is a small 10 months course after graduation. And he was selected there in the month of June 1985. He passed out in April 86 in the 23rd Frontier Force Regiment of the Pakistan Army. This man has, you know, everybody has some grey area in his life. He has three children. He is married in Jhangi district of Pakistan. His father-in-law is a businessman and his wife Iram gave him three children, two sons and a daughter. The daughter is married to an army major and he is presently posted in London. But the tragedy in his personal life is that Asim Muni's two sons are mentally sick. They are special ch children, special boys you can say. And it has been observed by Western intelligence agencies that sometimes both of them accompany their father to his office Sometimes all three go in track suits. So basically all of them, I mean, he has that disturbed life so far as his personal life is concerned. I may also add for the knowledge of young students that Pakistan Army's headquarters is a former residence of a 1948 batch IFS officer 
who was whose last posting in 1980-81 was in the in Sri Lanka as India's High Commissioner. His name was Ambassador Gurbachan Singh. His residence is now the headquarters of Pakistan Army in Rawalpindi. Brief introduction. This is Asim Muni. On 16th of June 2019, the main event started. Prime Minister Imran Khan was ruling. I'll take one minute and then we'll come to Nawaz Sharif. Prime Minister Imran Khan was ruling. The first audience was sought by General Asim Munir, who was at that time a Lieutenant General and Chief of ISI. He met Imran Khan and told him about the corruption of his third wife. And he dilated a lot. He had brought certain files, certain papers, where kickbacks and money had been taken by certain front men of his wife, of Imran Khan's wife. That made Imran very angry, very livid. And the moment he went back, he called the Army Chief General Bajwa and told him to dismiss him from service, sack him. General Kamar Javed Bajwa tried to mellow down Imran Khan, but I think it was Imran's foolishness and indiscreetness that he was so open with an army chief that showed his lack of administrative experience. He said, no, I want him to be dismissed from service. But anyway, by evening, a decision was taken to remove Asim Munir as ISI chief, date 16th June 2019. And he was shifted to 30th Corps in Gujranwala. He joined there the very next day. Now, there was another element, not only the removal, at 10 p.m. on that day, his successor took over as ISI chief. Now, the handing over, taking over took place at 10 p.m. in the night. Very unusual art, very humiliating. Generally, as Mahatma Gandhi wrote, nobody forgets his insult. One remembers that. Asim Munir kept that insult in his heart. And now he's returning the compliments to Imran Khan because he has got the chance. So this is about Asim Muni. Now the second character I am taking is Nawaz Sharif. Excuse me. Nawaz Sharif is a, another story and then I will open up on the topic. In 1860-61, there was a converted Brahmin family from Anantanag which migrated to Amritsar. The name of that band was Khuda Baksh. His Gotra, as they say, was Bhatt. He was a Bhatt Brahmin, converted to Islam, and they had migrated to Amritsar because of penury, because of poverty. Khuda Baksh started selling flowers in Amritsar. And generally, after a few years, he was known as, his name was Dulla, Dulla Fulonwala. That was the name given to the family, Dulla Fulo Waloki family. Fifteen years later, one of his sons, Ramzan Sharif, didn't like this business and shifted to a village called Jati Umrah around 1875-76 and started doing the work of blacksmith. So Ramzan Sharif settled in his 250 square yard house in Jati Umra village, which is now in the Tarantaran district of Amritsar. There he had seven children, seven boys. The fourth in that hierarchy was a man called Muhammad Sharif, born in 1919. This Muhammad Sharif did his matric and started assisting a Hindu business family in Lahore who was in the business of foundries. In 1947, when that family was migrating to India, they gave their small foundry to their office clerk, Muhammad Sharif. And from Muhammad Sharif is the father of Nawaz Sharif. He had three sons, Nawaz Sharif, Abbas Sharif and Shabal Sharif. So Nawaz is his eldest son. The middle one is no more. 
Abbas Sharif and the last one is Shahbaz Sharif who has been Prime Minister recently, till recently. These two characters are going to play some role, some important role in the next few weeks to come and for the youngsters I just wanted to introduce them that these are the two people who are now going to play some conspicuous role in the next few weeks, next few months. Now, the my topic for submission today is Pakistan, the rule by establishment. Actually, every country, every society, every nation state has the establishment. The only thing is, and I am quoting from some of my articles which I wrote on this topic. I would say, and I have quoted from one of my articles in Statesman, and I am quoting it. When non-political forces take advantage of a fragile democracy and control the instruments of power, it leads to the emergence of a strong establishment. I repeat. When non-political forces take advantage of a fragile democracy, a delicate democracy and control the instruments of power, it leads to the emergence of a establishment. One can quote various models of establishments. There is a very strong establishment in Turkey. There is a very strong establishment in Myanmar. There is a very strong establishment in Nigeria. There is a very strong establishment in certain Latin American countries. But we will go in, will not go into that. Pakistan has a establishment right from its beginning, like any other state. But for today's presentation, I'll divide it into three parts. The three parts would be the present times, the Imran period, the period of Musharraf onwards, 99 to 2018 and the first 50 years. So broadly we will divide it into four parts. Present times, we all know Asim Munir is ruling. I have given you the brief introduction about Asim Munir. He is calling the shots. They are deciding as to which party would rule, which party would be headed by whom, which party would be allowed to participate in elections, when is election going to be held, all these decisions are taken by Asim Munir, supported by a bunch of generals. In case of Pakistan, though prognostication and inferences, I will do it in the end, but I will just discuss. We all know that in April last year, the government of Imran Khan was removed by the establishment. Imran Khan ruled from August 2018 till April 2022. It was a three and a half years period. The general impression given was that establishment and Imran Khan are on the same page and they are taking decisions unanimously. But Certain actions, as I have quoted, that action of 16th June 2019 when he removed Asim Munir, everything was passed on to Asim Munir by General Bajwa and he put the blame on Imran Khan. Similarly, certain other issues like an effective chief minister in the province of Punjab in Pakistan and certain other issues were there which led to the increase of differences between the establishment and Imran Khan government. The trust deficit and misunderstandings started increasing with the passage of time and ultimately the establishment decided that we have to remove this man otherwise disaster is going to follow. And he was ultimately removed in April 2022 from power. The Imran period was earlier having that 19 year period of Musharraf, Asif Ali Zardari and Nawaz Sharif. In 99, we all know the establishment led by Musharraf took over reins of government in Pakistan. Musharraf ruled for almost 9 years till 2008 and from 2008 till 2013, it was Asif Ali Zardari and his PPP which led the government. They had two different prime ministers. 
who were there at that time and then for five years there was the government of Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz which was there which was ruling from 2013 to 2018 till Imran took over. If we go further in the first 50 years before we open up on that I would like to define a little bit about establishment. In Pakistan's context the establishment, what is establishment? Establishment basically is the army, the defense forces supported by the bureaucracy, supported by the judiciary, supported by corrupt politicians and supported by business people and the press and media. This is establishment. In context of Pakistan, it has a humongous presence. Almost all districts have ISI units. They keep a watch on politicians, on the administrative officers, they keep a watch on businessmen, they keep a watch on press, they keep a watch on media, they keep a watch on the TV coverage and even the social media channels. The second thing which is there in Pakistan's establishment is it prevails over politicians even when there is a facade or there is a face of civilian rule. There could be a civilian prime minister, but it is the establishment which calls the shots there. The final calls, the final decisions are taken by the establishment. Establishment means the army, the defense forces, the ISI, supported by bureaucracy, by the judiciary, by corrupt politicians and by businessmen and press and media. So this whole compendium is establishment. Establishment controls judiciary, the bureaucracy, the press and the media. The establishment of Pakistan monitors and controls all financial deals, business activity, even as small a thing like petrol price, diesel price or deals with foreign agencies like World Bank, IMF. All these are monitored, controlled, guided and final calls taken by the establishment. The most important part which the establishment of Pakistan does is it deals with the foreign policy. It is foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis India, Iran, Afghanistan, China, USA, Middle East and all other important countries is a domain of establishment and a civilian ruler has no say in that. The final, it is a no-go area for a civilian prime minister or a civilian foreign minister. It is basically the domain, the fiefdom of establishment. The second part which is totally under the control of establishment is the nuclear policy. No civilian leader in Pakistan is allowed to interfere or to give any recommendation regarding the nuclear assets of Pakistan. The third is related that is the defense policy and decisions regarding army, ISI, air force, navy, paramilitary, security forces etc. These are all taken by the establishment. The civilian leader has no role in that. The press and media and the social media is controlled by the establishment. The judiciary, it is supposed to be independent but it takes orders, it is totally pusillanimous, it takes orders from the establishment and in all important cases regarding politicians like Imran Khan or his party leaders, the final call is by the establishment and they take a decision and they decide whom to arrest, whom to detain, whom to release and whom to keep in jail. There have been even kidnappings beyond the purview of judiciary. Many journalists were kidnapped and kept in the custody of ISI and were not allowed to be released despite court orders. Even if the court orders there, they are again arrested. In many cases, 20 times the same person has been arrested despite his bails. So this is the humongous presence of a establishment in context of Pakistan as we understand. Who would form the government, as I have said? Who would lead the major political parties? How many seats are to be given to which party are all decided by the establishment? Now the question comes, why the establishment became so strong in case of Pakistan and didn't become so strong, let us say, in case of India? Actually, the crisis was in the party which divided India, the Muslim League. I have always believed and I have scanned the 
most of the literature of that period had there been no jinnah britishers would have created another jinnah so jinnah was going to be there it was decided by the british deep state by the british establishment that they would not hand over india on a platter to congress that was very clear so they they wanted to create somebody so jinnah was created had there been not jinnah they would have created somebody else this led to a situation that there was a man who got a country but who 10 years ago till 37 had only 1500 workers muslim league had 1500 members till 1937 it had no base it was only as late as after the end of second world war in 1945 when it became clear that india might be divided and there would be a pakistan that big landlord baderas big businessman belonging to muslim religion they started joining the bandwagon of Jinnah because they had their own self-interest and self-interest definitely affects your actions. So Britishers forced, the British bureaucracy forced that these people join Muslim League and join Jinnah and the party was expanded, was made a big party. It was decided by the Britishers that they would hand over this country in a divided form and they would hand over Pakistan to Muslim League led by Jinnah. So the base was not there. The leadership was there but base was not there. And one year after independence Jinnah died. The leadership was so weak that in the first 11 years there were 7 prime ministers and 4 presidents. Pakistan in the first 11 years had 7 prime ministers and 4, four presidents. This led to a situation that weak leadership was there and this weak leadership could not face the onslaught of establishment. If you ask me and in brief, since I am going to wrap up, only two instances are there in the 76 years history of Pakistan when the establishment was not dominant. First three and a half years till February 51. In February 51, Ayub Khan took over and he was also as Commander-in-Chief of Pakistan Army and he was also made the Defense Minister. Again a very strange thing, a distortion, a perversion that a Commander-in-Chief was also the Defense Minister of the country. He was also wearing dress, he was drawing salary as an officer and was also the Defense Minister of the country and would sit in the cabinet meetings and take important calls. So February 51 is the cutoff point, first three and a half years establishment was not so strong. And the second is well known that from 20th December 71 till 5th July 1977 when Mr. Bhutto was ruling. That is the second period. So in the whole history of Pakistan, there are only two instances. The first three and a half years till February 51 when establishment was not having the dominant position. And the second was 20th December 71 till 5th July 77 when Mr. Bhutto was ruling, when establishment was playing second fiddle to the leadership, civilian leadership. Otherwise, in the complete 76 years history of Pakistan, almost 68 years, it has been calling the shot, it has been ruling Pakistan and it is still ruling. Now, in the end, if you ask me, is there any chance of a civilian leader taking over or taming or controlling the establishment of Pakistan? At least as far as I am concerned as a student of Pakistan's political history, I don't see any chance of a civilian leader taking over in the near future from the establishment all these important decisions. The establishment is going to rule and it is going to play a very very dominant role. No doubt Mr. Nawaz Sharif might try and might make an attempt to become the Prime Minister for the fourth time but he will not have free hand or as they say the French word carte blanche, free hand in all important decisions. No, establishment will never allow its domain to be penetrated by any civilian leader. So for the next few years, the establishment of Pakistan is going to play an important role in the months and weeks to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Kaushik. You know, like he's a picture, he has an entire, what should I say, a, and a room full of information, the kind he can go on. I have heard him before. And uh, 
and it's a, it is always a pleasure you know like the manner in which he narrates his his details is something which is you can go on the, the style of storytelling and talking about dense issues but in just one point that you know like he is a trained political scientist shows the manner in which he has put us in a framework of how we define establishment how we define you know when you are talking about the nature of the